All right, now we're continuing on. I started a series a couple weeks ago where we're going through the Ten Commandments. And as we see here, in Ex Exodus chapter 20 contains all the Ten Commandments as they're, they're kind of historically um, laid out the way that, that God laid them out. But um, as I've mentioned in previous sermons, you know, those simple Ten Commandments, there's a lot more to it than just what said, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. There's, it goes a lot more in depth, especially in the Old Testament, a lot more um, being like specifics, you know, regarding all these commands. And we see here in Exodus chapter 23, a lot of the Ten Commandments are repeated and we go a little bit more in depth. And what we're covering this morning is a commandment that says not to bear false witness. Now, what does it mean to bear false witness? It's, I mean, very simply, it just means lying. But what you do when you bear a false witness, you're, you're witnessing to something, you're saying something, like maybe something happened, that, that I witnessed this, and this is the way it happened, and what you're saying is, is incorrect. It's false. It's not true. Um, that's all it means to bear false witness, and that is one of the Ten Commandments. If we look down at Exodus 23, where we started off reading, look at verse number 1. It's, this is the same thing. It says, thou shalt not raise a false report. You're giving a report about something. You're, you're explaining something that happened. It's the same thing as bearing a false witness. He says, put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. So we're, we're seeing here that people who give false witness are wicked. And he's saying, don't you be like those wicked people. Don't, don't you raise an unrighteous witness and be wicked like the wicked people that do this already. Verse number two, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Now, the biggest problem with lying is that it can be so easy to do. And one of the reasons why it's so easy is that, I mean, you think about children at a young age. Girls, sit over one more chair and pay attention and be good. We learn how to lie from a very young age. You don't have to be taught how to lie. Every, I mean, the, the little children learn how to tell lies. And usually it's because you don't want to get into trouble. The, 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 the most common reason why people tell a lie is because they've done something wrong and you don't want to be discovered. You don't want what you've done to come to light. You don't want people to know about that, and especially with children. They know, hey, if my mom or my dad finds out about this, I'm going to get a spanking. I'm going to get disciplined. You know, this is not something I want anyone to know about. So they tell a lie. They say, you know, how did, how did this glass get broken? I don't know. <laughs> did you do it? No. And then, of course, you come to find out they're the only one, and it's, you know, they, they obviously did it. But the reason why I tell that lie is because they don't want to be found out. Now, it's the most common thing, and we see here, you know, and especially in our culture, and probably in most cultures, telling lies, the more people do it, and it's with any sin, but lies is probably the most common. The more culture, the more people do it, the more accepted it becomes. Because it's like, well, I do that, and I, you know, and for good reasons you don't want to be a hypocrite you don't want to you know condemn someone else when you do the same exact thing so the more that that people are involved in a sin just the more generally accepted those sins become now just because everybody may be doing it obviously it doesn't make it right and one of the things that I like to show people when we go out and give the gospel and knock doors is explain how serious because lying is a serious thing and and, and this is one of the main points. We all know that lying is wrong. You know, I don't think there's anybody sitting in here this morning that thinks, well, no, actually, it's okay to tell lies. It's okay to bear false witness. So I don't feel like I need to convince you that that's wrong. But we, need, we do need to understand the severity of this, of this issue and, and how serious it is because we have this tendency to downplay these certain sins just because everybody's doing it when it ought not to be downplayed. We ought to take these things seriously. We ought to say, oh yeah, well, of course, I told a lie, so what? You know, that we ought never to have an attitude like that. But it's easy to have those types of attitudes, again, when, when it's socially acceptable. So yeah, oh yeah, I lied. Well, everybody lies. And it's these days, I mean, you come to just e expect people to lie. And it's sad. It's a sad state of affairs when you just go and expect people to lie to you. And, but that's the way it is. I, I just bought a, a vehicle last week, a used vehicle. And as I'm going around and talking to people, it's like you have to try to cut through their lies. 
You have to try to ask, you know, catch them and ask questions because you're auto, like at least me, I'm automatically thinking like, this person wants to sell this old used vehicle, they're probably gonna lie to me about what's wrong with it. And that's exactly what happened. Even though I try, even though I know this is what's gonna happen, the person I bought my vehicle from lied to me, to my face, lied about the, the, the condition of the vehicle. And it's nothing new, I'm not shocked by it. It, it makes me upset. I think it's, it's, it's horrible that people still do that, that people lack integrity and that people are no longer, you know, a man of their word. When you say something, it ought to matter. And I preached an entire sermon about this, about being a man of your word. Your word means something. And when you start telling lies, you know, why is anyone going to give you any respect or why is anyone going to believe you? Once you start getting caught telling lies, then your word becomes meaningless. Because how is anyone ever going to think, oh yeah, well now you're telling me the truth. How do I know you're telling me the truth? Once you get caught in one lie, it's a lot harder for people to believe you. And unfortunately, we live in a society today where there's a lot of people that have no problems telling lies. And this is another reason too. I mean, we ought, we ought to always be careful and not just be completely trusting of people either. And the way that I, the way I look at this is that I don't just always assume people are lying, but I take everything that I see and I hear with a grain of salt. And, and you know, you don't just automatically just naively receive things that you hear just to be automatically true. But at the same time, you don't just go around accusing everybody of lying either, right? And with the guy that sold me the car, I mean, I didn't just go around accusing him of lying to me because I didn't know. And I found out facts later on that proved that he was, but... <clears throat> I was suspicious you know, of the things that he was saying, but I'm not just, just full out going to call him a liar. But it, it, it's unfortunate that we have, that so many people you know, downplay this sin. And this is why I like to show people when we go out soul winning is Revelation 21.8. You can turn it if you like. It's all the way at the end of the Bible. Revelation chapter 21. Because what most people have a problem with, in general, a lot, everyone pretty much agrees that they're a sinner. I mean, everyone will agree, like, oh yeah, I've done wrong, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect, you know, I'm not, I, 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 I've done wrong, I've broken God's commandments. But what they have a hard time grasping is the, the severity of the sins that they've committed. Because most people I talk to, when I ask them if they know for sure if they're going to heaven when they die, they'll say yes, and the reason why they believe that they're going to heaven is because, well, I haven't done anything that bad. That's the typical answer. It's, it's, well, I'm a pretty good person. And this is how people judge themselves. They judge themselves in relation to the rest of society. And they say, well, there's these people over here that are really wicked, really bad. You know, they've murdered, they've killed, they're child molesters or what, you know, whatever it is. Those are really bad people. And sure, they are, right? But they look at that and say, well, I don't do those things. Maybe I go to church. Maybe I pray. Maybe I help people out. I do other good things. Therefore, I'm going to heaven when I die because I'm not that bad. I'm pretty good. I do good things. But what they fail to realize is that when you have committed these other sins that you've already admitted, you're like, yeah, of course I've sinned. I'm not perfect. Those sins that you've committed are also worthy of the same punishment as a murderer as far as hell is concerned. They are worthy of receiving that punishment of hell. And Revelation 21.8 explains this very clearly. It says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So the person that says, well, I've never killed anybody. I mean, I don't think I deserve hell because I didn't, you know, I haven't done anything that bad. I say, well, have you ever told a lie before? Because anybody that says no is lying right there. You're, you're all, I can, if you say no, then you're a liar. Because you have. Everybody's told a lie before. But like I was saying, you know, we have a tendency to downplay that just because everyone's done it. Well, yeah, well, we've all done that. But no, it's very serious. And in God's eyes, telling a lie is worthy. He says all liars. He didn't say some liars. He didn't say habitual liars. He didn't say the really bad liars. All liars shall have their parts in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So you may have never murdered anybody. You may have never done anything that horrible, but if you've told a lie, that's bad enough in God's eyes. See, we're not, when we, people have a tendency to judge themselves in man's eyes, but in God's eyes is a whole other story. 
In man's eyes, sure, you're a great person. But in God's eyes, the Bible says there is none good, no, not one. The Bible says there is none that doeth good and sinneth not. That's God's eyes. That's God's perspective. So when we view, can view ourselves in God's eyes, we realize, hey, I deserve this punishment of hell. And this is where a lot of people have a hard time with because that's why they never receive a Savior because they don't think they need saving. They don't think they need salvation because if you're not that bad and you don't deserve hell anyways, then what do you need to be saved from? But we need to understand that, yes, we do need a Savior because even the smallest of sins, even what we consider the, to be the least, like telling a lie, is bad enough to deserve hell. And that is what we deserve. And we have to look at it in that type of view. And don't forget this, even after you're saved, don't forget that God has a penalty of hell on the, the sin of telling a lie. We can trick ourselves into thinking that, oh, I just told a lie, so what? I still go to church. I still do all these good things. Don't ever allow yourself to get into that type of a mindset with any sin. Now, we're obviously, we're dealing with lies this morning, with bearing false witness. But regardless of the sin, don't let yourself get into that type of an attitude where you're just ambivalent or you just don't care. Because that is a very, very poor attitude to have with God and God will not bless you when you have that type of an attitude. But let's go ahead and turn to um, Deuteronomy chapter 19. Because we're going to see what the Bible prescribes as one of the punishments for someone who does bear false witness. Now, in this instance, when we're talking about bearing false witness, it's, it's a false witness against somebody else. So we're, um, you know, when, normally when there's a crime that's, that takes place, what do the police do? Or the you know, investigators are looking for witnesses. They're looking at people who witnessed that event that they can get a statement from so they can determine what are the facts of this case so we could find out who's innocent, who's guilty, who's at fault, who's to blame for whatever happened, for whatever was done that was wrong. And we see in Deuteronomy chapter 19, look at verse number 15. Um, it, the Bible is very clear here, explains, and I've gone over this recently. It says, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. And any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. So he's saying, right off the bat, because you have people that lie, because there's a motivation to lie, you can't just believe one person. He said, when, when, when you're doing the research, when you're doing the investigation, you know, if something happened that's wrong, you have one person's word against another person's word, you don't know what to believe because if they have conflicting results, one of them's lying. One of them's not telling the truth, but you can't determine who is right and who's wrong. But when you start having two or three witnesses that their witness agrees together and they all say, yeah, this is what happened. This is the way it went down. I saw the whole thing. Now you have multiple people as evidence to say, okay, the matter is established and you have to go off of something. Now, is it possible that two or three people can lie? Of course it is. But this is the standard that's set forth in the Bible of how we come up to, the, to these conclusions in these cases. Let's keep reading here, verse 16. It says, If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition, and behold, if the witness be a false witness, and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother, so shalt thou put the evil away from among you. So he's saying, okay, if, if there's a false witness, obviously someone's saying one thing, another guy's saying another thing, so it's going to come before the judges. It's going to come before the priests. They're going to diligently inquire. They're going to you know, uncover every stone and try to come to the truth of this matter. And whoever it's found out, if you say, this person's lying, this person is bringing up an accusation against someone falsely and it's not true, their punishment is whatever the punishment would have been had that other person been found guilty of that sin or of that crime. And if that means... You know, if someone were coming at another person and saying, this person stole my ox, right? Let's just put this in, in Old Testament terms. So this person stole my ox. He stole my animal. Well, 
normally the the punishment for that would be they'd have to to give like fourfold or fivefold. You know, I think an ox was five. They'd have to repay as the as the punishment for for committing that type of a sin or that type of a crime. That would mean that the person telling the lie then they would owe the other person five oxen for trying to, to lie about them because that's what they would have received in return. It's the same exact punishment except that goes to that person. So basically, the judgment is the liar, the false witness, receives the same punishment as if he actually had done that crime that he is accusing someone else of. And I mean, you, you look at it, basically lying is just as bad as doing it. When you're lying about that, if you, if you were to lie about someone and say, that person killed so-and-so, he's guilty of murder. Well, the, the Bible prescribes the death penalty on murderers. The liar, if someone lies about something that serious and it's found out, that liar needs to be put to death. This is the way that God established his law and his law is perfect. And this is, you know, there's a lot of wisdom to this. But, but think about that, how serious that is. So when you tell lies, the bigger the lie the more severe the punishment will be. And, um, and this is the way that the Bible deals with it. Now, this same concept actually applies in the New Testament. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter number 5. We'll see the same thing. And we see the way that this is dealt with in um, church matters. But, you know, I forgot to keep reading to the end of that verse. So I'll keep reading in Deuteronomy 19. Go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy 5. But in Deuteronomy 19, verse 20, it says, And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you and thine eyes shall not pity but life shall go for life eye for eye tooth for tooth hand for hand foot for foot so he's saying the reason why we have this punishment against this false witness is because once people hear about this when they say oh man i'm gonna think twice now about telling a lie because it's easy to tell a lie i mean you're just saying words you're just saying words out in the air, and if there's not that many people around that no one really knows, it's a lot easier to get away with telling a lie because you're just, you're just bearing a witness. You're just saying, yep, I saw this, and who else? You might think no one else is around to prove you wrong, so how is anyone, you know, it's an easy thing that you can get away with, but um, when you start to understand that, well, whatever I'm lying about can come back on me, the exact same thing, that ought to make you think twice. And that's why he says, you know, those that hear, those which remain, that when they hear about this, they're going to fear and henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. 1 Timothy chapter 5, look at verse number 19. Now this is talking about in the church. He says, against an elder, receive not an accusation. Now elder is another name for a pastor or a bishop. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. And what's interesting about this verse is he says, them that sin. Now them, is that singular or plural? That's plural, of course, right? So this is not referring to the elder sinning. It's talking about the, the witnesses that rise up because you need to have two or three witnesses to be, to be brought up against an elder, against a pastor. He says, them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. So when someone is going to, because this happens in churches probably more frequently than you realize. Um, I mean, it's never happened in this church, but obviously our church is very young and we're very small. But what happens as a church grows is that Satan wants to come in and attack the church, especially a church that's doing a lot of good things for God. And he's going to come and try to split churches up. And one of the ways he does that is he'll use a false witness to bring an accusation against the pastor, against, against the, you know, the, the elder of that church who's, who's running the church and start bringing up lying accusations and try to get people pitted against the pastor so that way the church can split up and come to nothing. And that's one of the attacks that the devil uses against his churches. Now, I'm not saying that the elder's never wrong. I mean, there's, there's obviously, there's false prophets, there's people that, and, and there are men too that can succumb to sin just like anyone else. But he's saying that the way you deal with this is 
You need to have two or three witnesses. You can't just have one person making an accusation against the pastor of a church. You need to have more than one witness in order to establish the matter. But if their witnesses are false, if it comes out, if the, if the investigation's made and it comes out, no, these people are lying. It says, them that sin rebuke before all. So this isn't something that should just get swept under the rug, which often happens in churches when, when there's these types of problems. It's not something that you just, just push away and ignore. He says, no, they need to be rebuked before all that others also may fear. And what are they fearing? It's fearing telling a lie, bearing a false witness. This, this is in direct correlation with Deuteronomy 19 that we just read. In, um, turn, if you would, to the book of Proverbs, because we're going to be spending quite a bit of time. We're going to see a lot of wisdom about lying and bearing false witness, false witness in Proverbs. But in Matthew 18, just to give you a little bit more insight on church matters, the Bible says in Matthew 18, 15, However, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church... Let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. So this is explaining, look, if someone does you wrong in the church, the first thing that you ought to do is go to that person directly. Confront that. There's no reason. And look, I hate backbiting. I hate people spreading rumors and, and just talking about other people behind their back. This is not what we need in church at all. If someone does you wrong, don't go to your friend in church and start saying, oh yeah, can you believe so-and-so did this to me? And start, start talking about that person and gossiping about them and trying to pit other people against other people in the church. If you have an issue with someone individually, the, the, the Bible prescribes right here in Matthew 18 how we ought to deal with this. The first thing you do is confront them. Now look, a lot of people don't like confrontation. I get it. But if you don't like confrontation and you don't want to deal with it, then close your mouth. You need to be able to at least deal with that person directly. Whoever you think has done you wrong, because oftentimes someone might, you, you think someone does you wrong and they have no idea what they did. Offended you or hurt you or did you did wrong. You know, so you could be sitting there all upset about another person. They have no idea. And then all of a sudden you start going around and talking to other people and a bunch of people hate this other person. And before you know it, you have factions starting up and, and people you know, getting angry with each other and things blowing way out of proportion than what needs to be done. And it's wickedness to be gossiping and talking about other people behind their back anyways. Even if what they did happened, you shouldn't be doing that. The way that we ought to deal with this is first, deal with that person directly. Now, if you can't come to, a, to an agreement, to some kind of a, of a conclusion on the matter where, where you're both satisfied that, that, that the issue is taken care of, he says, okay, if they're not going to hear you, if they say, no, I didn't do you any wrong, you know, I didn't do any, you know, whatever, then you bring a couple other people with you. You, you get one or two people involved. It's not the whole church. It's just, we're going to, okay, I want everything that we say to be established. And this is why witnesses are so important. Because this is how we establish matters. It's, by, it's, it's through using witnesses. So you bring witnesses here to say, okay. And it's kind of, if you, if you will, it's almost like a mediation. I mean, you're, you're talking with the other person and these other people can hear and, and help to establish every word and say, yes, this person said that and yes, that person said that. So there's no discrepancy in the matter. But... After the, the witnesses are there, they hear everything and they kind of help give their judgment. If, the, you know, if this one person is just being real stubborn and just won't listen, he says, then you bring it unto the church. So now we get the whole church involved and say, okay, well, there's still this problem. And the reason why we go through all this stuff is because we don't want to have these problems in church. It needs to be dealt with. Now, dealing with problems isn't always fun. I get it. But we need to get past these things. So you can't let this... This type of stuff fester when there's problems within, with church members. You can't let it fester. Because you let it fester, it's going to destroy the church. It's, it's like a cancer. It's going to grow. And there's going to be ill feeling. There's going to be bitterness. And we're not going to be in unity together serving the Lord. Because there's going to be people that, that, that have it out for each other, whatever. So if it gets to this point, then it's brought before the church. And the church is going to make the final judgment. And if a person still neglects to hear what the church passes as the judgment in the matter, then that person, it says, to be un let him be unto thee a heathen man and a publican. And what that means is 
they're, they're ousted. You don't have anything to do with them. You don't go out to eat with them. You don't you know, spend any time with them. If that's the way they're going to be, if they can't accept you know, going through this type of a process, then they're too rebellious and they're not going to be, you know, they're, they're, they're breaking up the church and they're not going to be a part of the church. So that's, um, that's the way that we deal with these things. But you can see, you know, establishing every, every word is important for a witness. Now you're in Proverbs chapter 6. Look at verse number 16. Sorry, turn to Proverbs 6. I said we're going to the book of Proverbs. Turn to chapter 6. We're going to start going through get a lot of wisdom. So we have a tendency to take things lightly, but the, the, the Bible gives strong language against telling lies. And we see that here in Proverbs chapter 6. <clears throat> Excuse me. Proverbs 6.16 6, says, These six things doth the Lord hate. So I don't think God hates. God hates things. There's a lot of things that God hates, and we have to understand. And when God hates something, we want to make sure that we're not having any part of that. God is love, God is long-suffering, God is merciful, and praise the Lord for it. God has forgiven us of our sins if you're saved this morning. But God still hates things, and we don't want to be coming across God's path and doing the things that He hates. He says, these six things, uh, Proverbs 6.16, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto Him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. And notice in this list of seven things, he mentions lying twice. Two times. Now, we need to take note of that because he's saying, first of all, he's saying, you know, six things God hates. Yes, seven are an abomination. And he lists a lying tongue and a false witness that speaketh lies as, the, as part of that list of seven things. Because it's really six things, but, it, but he lists it twice. We ought to take very important note of that. God hates that, and he hates it again. I mean, that, that's how he feels about it. He's like, I hate lying. Don't get caught up in lying. Your word means so much. Flip, if you were, we're just going to start going through Proverbs here. Uh, flip over to chapter 10. And I've got them all in order because I want to see. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on any one of these necessarily in particular, but I want to see all these different references to lying and what the Bible says about it. Verse 18 of Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs 10, 18. He that hideth hatred with lying lips and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. So the Bible says you're a fool if you're, if you're lying, if you're hiding your hatred with lying lips. Ver, uh, flip over to chapter 12, verse 19. Proverbs 12, 19. Proverbs 12, 19. The lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Sit over there. The lip of truth shall be established forever. So when you tell things that are true, hey, your word stands. That, that, the God's word. God's word is everlasting. God's word is truth. God's word is going to last forever. When you say things that are right and that are true, hey, that's established. That's something that will last because it's true. It can't be proven false if, it's, if what you're saying is true. But a lying tongue is just but for a moment. Your lies eventually you usually end up being uncovered and found out and that lie is only going to last for a moment and then your word is going to be uh, made meaningless and all the things that you say, even if they're true, aren't going to end up um, being respected by anyone. Proverbs 12, look at verse 22. The Bible says, Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are His delight. So again, we see abomination is a very strong word of hatred from the Lord. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 13, verse number 5. Proverbs 13, verse number 5. The Bible says, A righteous man hateth lying, but a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. If you're a righteous person, you know, you ought to hate lying. You ought to, that ought to be something that, that, that angers you, that... that you really won't accept or tolerate is a lying is is a lying tongue. 
Proverbs 14, verse 25. Proverbs 14, 25 says, A true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. Proverbs 19, flip over to Proverbs 19. Basically says the same thing here twice in Proverbs 19, verse number 5 and verse number 9. Verse 5 says, A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Verse 9 says, A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall perish. So, don't think that you're getting away with anything because in, man, in man's eyes, you might be getting away with something, but God knows your hearts. God knows your thoughts. God knows the truth of the matter. And you might think you're getting away with something, but you're not. When you tell, just remember that. When you, whatever, whatever it is that, you, that you're going to avoid, if you're going to get yourself out of a mess by telling a lie, consider this. You may spare yourself temporarily from that, from whatever that consequence would be where you have to just tell a lie about it. But God sees what happens and God will make sure that you are going to get what's coming to you. God will discipline us as his children appropriately. And when we start telling lies to try to get ourselves off the hook for something and for something that, you know, we've rightfully done or we've wrongfully done, maybe you could say, where we've been in the wrong and we've done something and we ought to fess up to it and just face the music and, and, and take our punishment that whatever the consequence may be for our actions, you know, we ought to be doing that. If we don't, if we try to hide from that and tell lies to avoid that, you better believe that God's going to come back and bring that on you in one form or another and you'll probably end up paying a lot worse than if you would have just been honest and not told, not bear a false witness. Um, turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 21. Because the Bible says that false witness shall not be unpunished. You will, go, you will get punished for your false witness. Proverbs 21, 6. The getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a vanity tossed to and fro of them that seek death. So it, it's meaningless to, to go. You know, a lot of people will lie just to make some money. As I mentioned in the, in the car example, you know, what, what are they trying to do? They're trying to make some money. They're trying to, to get money by deceitful gain. They're just they'll, they're they're willing to lie to you, and, and you know, and it's sad. But we live. I mean, everyone knows the used car salesman, right? I mean, it, it's it's a it's a job that has a lot of people disdain that that job, or or we throw around that term because it, you know we make jokes about it because a used car salesman oftentimes has. has become synonymous with someone who sells junk and someone that's going to lie to you to try to get you in a vehicle just so that they can make some money. And um, that's the, the society we live in. But God hates it. God thinks it's an abomination. And we ought not to be, um, <clears throat> we ought to recognize it for what it is. Proverbs 24. Turn to Proverbs chapter 24. You're in 21, right? Mm -hmm. Proverbs 24. Look at verse number 28. The Bible says, Be not a witness against thy neighbor without cause, and deceive not with thy lips. Say not, I will do so to him as he hath done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. So don't, don't lie against your neighbor without a cause, and don't be vengeful or spiteful in trying to, to well, I'm going to make sure he gets his even if it means I'm going to lie about it and, and you know, he did something to me, so now I'm going to lie about him so that he gets punished. Don't have that type of an attitude. If we suffer wrongly, wrongfully, we're supposed to take it and let God be the judge and let God rule over these types of matters. Don't bring, add more sin unto yourself by then bearing a false witness against someone. Uh, Proverbs 25, 18, we're almost done in Proverbs. Proverbs 25, 18 says, A man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul and a sword and a sharp arrow. And then Proverbs 26, verse 28 says, A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth, mouth worketh ruin. Um, a person that's telling lies about other people, they, they hate that person according to the Bible. They, they don't love them at all because why would you be telling lies about them if you love them? Now, turn if you would to Isaiah 43. This is real interesting. I noticed this when I was doing my study on the false witnesses. Because there are false witnesses out there today that will even claim the name of God. There's a lot of, there's, there's a group of people and they're actually kind of big out here. I've noticed is the Jehovah, they call themselves the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? 
I call them Jehovah's false witnesses because what they say isn't true. They have a false gospel. And they claim to be witnesses for God, but what they're doing is they're, they're bearing a false witness. And this is a chapter, I brought this up in the past, but this is a chapter that I always like to bring them to to show them because obviously, you know, when we go out soul winning, you, you love people, you're trying to get them saved. It doesn't matter where they're from or what, what church they go to, you're trying to reach out to that soul to get them saved. And oftentimes people will repeat lies without even knowing it. They've been deceived. They've been tricked themselves by these lies. And the majority of the Jehovah's Witnesses that you run across, they've been deceived. They've been tricked into believing a lie. So what we try to do is to show them that they're, you know, the truth, show them God's word and explain why what they're believing in is a lie. Why that, how they've been deceived. But um, look in Isaiah 43. This is one of the places I like to show them, to, to, to just show them the truth about the matter. Um, Isaiah 43, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is truth. Verse 10, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Now, when I, when I show the Jehovah's Witnesses these verses, I precede this by asking them about Jesus Christ. I'll ask them to say, who is the Savior? Because they'll even say, they'll say, well, Jesus is the Savior. Who's the Savior? Jesus. And oftentimes I'll have already gone to John chapter 1 because I'll ask him, well, how many gods do you believe in? Because they'll always say, I believe in one God. But in their translation, in the New World Translation, their Bible, in John 1, 1, in the King James Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Great verse about the deity of Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. And they don't believe that. They believe that Jesus was a created being. So in their Bible, in that verse, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was a God. So I said, ask them, well, how many gods do you believe in? Because was Jesus God, like God Almighty, like God the Father, like God Jehovah? Or was he just a God, like a separate God? And when we turn to Isaiah 43, we see in verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So this is the Lord Jehovah. He said, I am the Savior. There is no other Savior, just me. So is Jesus the Savior or is Jehovah the Savior? And then he says, and he says in verse 10, you know, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. He's saying, there was no God formed before me, and there's not going to be any God formed after me. That settles the matter. There is no God formed. So is Jesus a God? And these are the things I like to show them to get, you know, to get them think. If they're going to be honest with themselves, they should at least be able to look at these verses and say, yeah, I've got a problem here. I don't understand how this can work because you have a contradiction. You have a contradiction of your terms. Verse number 12 says, I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work and who shall let it? And the other, the other point you can bring up when talking to Jehovah's Witnesses, he says, yea, before the day was, I am he. Because in John, Jesus Christ claimed, he says, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Jesus Christ claimed to be the I am he. He says, before Abraham was, I am. And that's why the Jews wanted to kill him, because he was making himself equal with God as the son of God, you know, claiming basically to be God in the flesh.
the Messiah. And, that, and that's, that's obviously who he was. But there's, there are so many aspects of this one chapter here. So if you take notes, write down Isaiah 43. It's a good place to bring Jehovah's Witnesses to expose a lot of, a lot of falsehoods in their doctrine so that they can put their faith on Christ and receive Him as their Savior as well. And see, we are to be witnesses. That's what God has for us. We are to be His witnesses. We are really to be Jehovah's true witnesses. That's what we're supposed to be as saved believers in Jesus Christ. We are to go and to witness the, the salvation of God unto other people. And to, to witness that, you know, like verse 11 says, I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. And the reason why that's true with Jesus Christ is because the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, you know, the, these three are one. And um, we believe in one God that has three parts. <clears throat> Now turn, if you would, to John chapter number 8. John chapter 8 in the New Testament. John chapter 8. Let's see where I'm at on time. We're going to see a group of people here in Jesus' day that actually they claim to believe the Ten Commandments. They claim they believe Moses' law, yet they sought out false witnesses. Now, one of the Ten Commandments is not to bear false witness, right? Yet we're going to see here, and actually keep your finger in, in John chapter 8, because we're going to go there. I was going to read this for you, but I want you to see it for yourself. Matthew 26. Keep your finger in John 8 and flip back to Matthew 26. Because there's no doubt the, Pharise the Pharisees and the Sadducees at the time, they claim they believe Moses' law. They claim they believe the Old Testament. They believe the prophets. They believed you know, that this was God's word and that we need to follow the law. And that's what, that was their big devil. They, they thought they needed to follow the law to be saved. They thought salvation came through obedience to the law. And if this is what they honestly believed, look at verse number 59 of Matthew 26. Matthew 26, verse number 59 the Bible says, now the chief priests, right, the, the highest rulers in the, in the church, the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. They knew they couldn't find anything that he had done wrong. You know, Jesus said, which of you convinceth me of sin? Nobody knew, you know, nobody was able to convince Jesus of sin because he never sinned. Nobody can say, oh yeah, Jesus is guilty of this sin because he never did anything wrong. He was perfectly sinless. So they had to seek, and this is them intentionally seeking out a false witness. They are specifically looking for someone to lie about Jesus Christ just so that they could put him to death. Because that's what they cared about. They hated him so much that they're going against supposedly what they believed. They believe in the Ten Commandments. They said they're seeking out a false witness. This is extremely wicked. These people, the, these, these chief priests and elders and all the council are, are, are extremely wicked going against supposedly what they believe in to seek out a false witness against Jesus to put him to death. Verse 60 says, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. So they kept trying to bring people and trying, and they knew they needed at least two witnesses because otherwise it wouldn't stand. So there's all these false witnesses that come up. People are just lying and lying and lying, but the witnesses weren't agreeing together. So the only thing that they could find where two people said the same thing was when he says, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. Now, is that a crime to say that I could, you know, that, that I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days? Now, that's not exactly what Jesus said, but this is the extent of their false witnesses they were able to find. But of course, they still bring false accusation and they're still able to, to um, bring him to death and basically just move Pilate to crucify him. They just, they, they mob rule against him to get them to crucify Jesus Christ. Because they had nothing against him. Pilate even was looking to send him go. He knew that he was innocent. Pilate knew he did nothing wrong. 
He knew that for envy they had delivered Jesus unto him. He knew that that man did nothing wrong, yet he just listened to what they had to say because he's a politician and just went with, well, there's all these people making a big stink and I'll just listen to this mob of people that want to destroy this man. And that's exactly what happened. Now, um, you know, they knew they were looking for people to lie about Jesus because they hated him. They knew it wasn't just and they knew that they were breaking the Ten Commandments that they claimed to believe in and follow. Now flip back to John chapter 8. And this ties in perfectly with the, the, the film that we're just talking about, the announcements, Marching to Zion, because we need to understand, and I, and I hate this term, we are not, in this church, we are not Judeo-Christian. We are not. We have nothing to do with Judaism. It is a false, satanic religion. We have nothing to do with Israel. We have nothing to do with a godless society that hates Jesus Christ and doesn't accept him as their savior. And I don't care who that is, but, but specifically, we see here what happened. Jesus Christ was crucified by the Jews. It was the chief priests. It was the scribes. It was, it was all these people that were the Jews, that, that the same religion that exists to this day are the ones that delivered up Jesus Christ. The ones that claimed to believe in the Ten Commandments just as they'll claim the same thing today, they don't actually believe that. Look at John chapter 8, verse 44. John 8, 44, words out of Jesus Christ's own mouth. Ye are of your father, the devil. Talking to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Jump down to verse number 54. John 8, 54 says, Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me of whom ye say that he is your God. He said, you say that you, you believe in God. Verse 55, yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his saying. Now turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2. It's right near the end of the Bible. 1 John chapter 2, you need to see this. 1 John, it's right before... You have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then the book of Jude, and then Revelation. So if you're going backwards, you have Revelation, Jude, 3rd John, 2nd John, 1st John. Look at 1st John, chapter number 2, because what are we talking about this morning? We're talking about bearing false witness and lying. And this ties in perfectly with, with the religion of Judaism, because first of all, in Jesus Christ's day, they delivered Jesus Christ up to be dead. They specifically sought out people to lie against him just to put him to death. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse number 22. We're going to see who the, the Bible defines as a liar. 1 John chapter 2, verse 22 says, Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. This is why we're not Judeo-Christian. Is it... Correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't Judaism today believe that there is a Messiah that's coming and it's not Jesus Christ? Who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? The Bible says that they're liars. They know Jesus was existed. They know about Jesus, but they say he was not the Christ. They're a liar. They're anti-Christ. We do not support or endorse people who are anti-Christ. Plain and simple. And we are not for that at all. And, and the Bible is very, very clear about this. It wasn't until just recently that, that, that people's mindset, especially in the Christian community, has changed on this issue. This is the way it's been all throughout history. And um, if you want more information about this topic, check out that new film because um, it goes a lot more in depth. I'm not going to go into that. That's not what the sermon is chiefly about this morning. But it, 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 it has to be brought up because... We're talking about lying. We're talking about bearing false witness. And if you don't believe that Jesus was the Christ, 
then you are a liar according to the Bible. Now, we're in 1 John chapter 2. Flip over just to 1 John chapter number 5. Stop it. 1 John chapter number 5. Because besides the, the people who don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, there are people that make God a liar. And the way that you make God a liar essentially is when you don't believe his words. You don't believe what's written. You don't believe what he said. So, for example, if I were to say, um, I have a white vehicle. Do you believe me? If you don't believe me, what are you saying? You're saying I'm a liar, right? I mean, plain and simple. It's, 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 it's not that difficult to say, okay. And now that's real silly. It's like, okay, well, whatever. There's no reason for you not to believe. Why would I even lie about something like that, right? But if you don't believe what I'm saying, if you say, hey, I have a white car, if you don't believe what I'm saying, then you're calling me a liar. You're saying you're lying. No, you don't, right? When we have God's word, we say, this is what God said. This is how you get saved. Or this is, you know, this is what the Bible says. God didn't say that. You're making God a liar. Or you, or you say that, that these words aren't true. Then you're making God a liar because these are his words. But we're going to see that here in 1 John chapter 5. Look at verse... And this is, this is the place I also like to bring people to when I'm preaching the gospel. Because some people will say, I know I've sinned. I know I need a Savior. I know the punishment for my sin is hell. I put my faith in Christ... But I think I could lose my salvation if I do X, Y, and Z. If I break these laws, if I do this, if I do that, you know, I could lose my salvation. And I, and, and I oftentimes will show them this verse because this encapsulates our salvation. There's so many verses that talk about, you know, we have eternal life. It's everlasting. You can never lose that. You know, um, John 5.24 is one of my favorite verses. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. You know, we can't lose our salvation. But look at John, uh, for, excuse me, 1 John chapter 5, where we are, 1 John chapter 5. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. So he's saying, if you don't believe the record that God gave of his Son, you're making God a liar. Because God gave us a record of his Son. And if you say, I don't believe that, then you're making God a liar. And he explains what that record is in verse number 11. Verse 11 says, and this is the record. So this is what we have to believe and if we don't believe this, then we're calling God a liar. Verse 11, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. So there's three points that I like to point out in this one verse, in verse 11. God hath given to us. So given means it's a gift. It's given. It's not earned. It's not deserved. It's not bought and paid for by us. It's given. God hath given to us. He's given to us what? Eternal life. How long is eternal? It's forever. If God gives you something and it doesn't last forever, then God's a liar. This is why I like to, to point out this verse especially because it says he's given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. It has to be through Jesus Christ. It, Jesus Christ is the only way. This is how we receive the gift. It's through Christ. Those main, three main points are critical for our salvation. If you don't believe those things, if you don't believe that it's given to you, that it's not based on your works, if you don't believe that it lasts forever, and if you don't believe that it's only through Jesus Christ, then you're making God a liar. Plain and simple. That's what the Bible says. So people who don't believe this record are making God a liar. Now, that my, people might say, oh, no, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think God's a liar. You can say that all day long, but if you don't believe these things, then you are. Kind of run out of time here. So let's... Um, all right, I'm not going to have you turn anywhere else. I've got a bunch more. To preach a sermon on telling lies, there's so much information in the Bible. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it short here. But basically, you know, people lie because there is an agenda. There's always a purpose to telling a lie, whether it be that, you know, a child not wanting to get in trouble or even an adult. I mean, not wanting to get in trouble. You do something at work. You make a big mistake. It costs the company a lot of money. Hey, I don't want to get found out about this. I'm going to tell a lie. There's a motive for that. Maybe you're trying to get somebody else in trouble. 
Maybe you are coveting another person's position at work and, and you want them to look bad in the eyes of the boss so that you can take their job, right? That happens today. There's an example of people telling a lie. There's a purpose behind telling that lie. Deceiving people. There's, you know, there's a lot of people that deceive you to get, some, to get you to do something that they want you to do. And this is, this is real common. This, this is where we get into the propaganda manipulation. I mean, the government's been using this for a long time. Propaganda, I mean, all governments use this. Propaganda on the people to get you to support a certain cause, to get you behind, you know, rally around whatever it is that they're trying to do. They, they will roll out a propaganda campaign and try to present you with certain information that's skewed or just plain out lies to get you on board with something that they want to do to get your support to get you to 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 sign up for it and the reason why so many people are willing to do this is because there's people have a, an attitude where they believe that the ends justify the means so they'll say it doesn't matter how we get there this is the main goal and anything that we have to do in between Hey, if it gets us to that end point, it doesn't matter. And that is a wicked, wicked worldly philosophy to follow because the ends don't justify the means. God has given us a set of a simple set of instructions and rules for us to follow. He doesn't say, well, and, and even if it's something good, think about, you know, oftentimes people will use that type of mentality for just their own, you know, wicked desires or, or whatever. But even if it's for something good, think about like like winning a soul to Christ. Right? That's a great thing to do, and that's something we should be doing. But even in that situation, the ends don't justify the means. If in order to, to accomplish that goal, we have to break God's commandments and do a bunch of other things and tell a bunch of lies and do all this other stuff, you don't do that. Because, first of all, you don't have to do that. If you're following God's laws and, and, and His rules, None of that stuff is even necessary. If you think you have to be breaking God's laws and His commandments to do a certain thing, then you're wrong. And you're not understanding God's word properly because you don't have to do that. And, and here's, a, here's a good example of that, though. That's even better because someone might say, like, well, I know it's a sin to be drinking and getting drunk and stuff, but I have this friend and he's unsaved and that's what he does. And he won't really listen to me unless I go and, and sit down and crack open some beers with him and say, but, but I'm going to be preaching the gospel to him. You know, that's wrong. Now, you may, in your mind, you might be thinking, well, this is how I have to reach him. I have to be doing these things in order to get to him. And, you know, God will overlook this sin of mine because I'm doing something greater. No, he won't. Because what's even better than that is you displaying and showing your own purity and saying, well, there are certain things that I won't do. Like when Paul says, I become all things, all men, that I might by all means save some. In that great famous passage of scripture, he says to those who are without the law as without the law, yet under the law to God. He says, you know, I try to do my best to, to come down to people's levels and to meet them where they're at and, and to, to be able to relate to people. But it still doesn't come at the cost of breaking God's laws. He said, I'm still going to be under God's laws. I'm not going to change that. And oftentimes, our own life and our walk with God is a testimony in and of itself. Now, I don't believe in just lifestyle evangelism as in you don't ever go and preach the gospel to people and people just automatically just look at the way you live and want to have what you have. But I do believe that we ought to be living a certain way to, to give you more credibility. To get, I mean, because here's the thing, and this is one of the reasons with me personally, I had a, a, a pitfall or a, one of my big sins just in my life was alcohol and drugs and things like that. And I was saved when I was 20 years old, yet I was into this stuff for a long time before getting right with God and getting in church and, and actually doing something productive with my life. During those years, I mean, I was saved and I knew there was always a, like, there's, the Holy Spirit works inside of you. And, and I wanted to be able to tell people about Christ and kind of share the gospel with them, but I couldn't because I felt like I was a hypocrite because 
here I am drinking. Why? And, and this is what I would think. Why would anybody want to listen to me about God's Word and about the Bible when here I am just getting drunk and, and doing all these other things that the Bible is very clearly against? And what I should have done was just get right <laughs> and, and move those things out. But my point is that I shouldn't have to feel like, oh, well, I need to do all those things to reach someone else. No, you're going to reach someone a lot more effectively when you can say, that stuff is wrong and I honestly believe God's Word. I don't just pick and choose the parts that I want to believe in and the parts I don't want to believe in. I take the whole thing and my life hopefully is evidence of that. Now, I'm not perfect, but I honestly and truly believe these things. That will make a lot more of an impact on a person's life or their impression or their, their willingness to even believe what you have to say than when you're making all these compromises in God's Word and your mind thinking in order to reach them. If that makes sense. Hopefully it does. But that's why we, won't, we don't want to be doing those things. And we don't want to... The ends don't justify the means. We don't need to be telling people lies in order to get the things that... Um, in order to get... Even if, it's, even if it's a good thing, we don't need to be um, doing that. So beware of the media. Beware of, of, of the propaganda that's out there because it's all over the place. Satan is a great illusionist. He's a deceiver. The devil is the great deceiver. He's out to deceive people. He's out to trick you. And he is the father of lies. And the devil is the prince of this world right now. Um, until Jesus Christ comes back and rules and reigns, the devil's running the show down here. The devil's got a lot of people in his pocket and, and that, are, that are doing things for him. And there's, there's spiritual wickedness in high places. And um, there's a lot of lies being pumped through the television, pumped through, the, through Hollywood, pumped through the, even the news. I mean... If you've ever been a part of a news story, of a, of a story that's been reported where you were actually there, or you actually witnessed something, and then you see the way it's reported and you see what's told, I don't know if you ever have, but I have been, and it's lies. Okay, there's always some truth in there. There's all, I mean, they're always reporting something that actually happened, right? But when you look at the circumstances, you look at the way that they present things, Everybody has an agenda. Everybody has a certain viewpoint. Everyone has a worldview. And that's going to come across in the way that they tell you things. And I can tell you firsthand, mainstream media and events that I was witnessed for myself going back and reading a story, when, especially when it's someone that they don't like and they want to portray in a negative light. Be aware of that. I'm not saying every single time you read something, it's always a lie. But just be aware of that, that people have an agenda. And don't just take everything that you see or everything you read as being the truth. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, help us to walk in the light as you are in the light. God, help us to, to have integrity. I pray that, that at least for the people in this room, that our word actually matters to us. That the things that we say, we can at least stand on them and defend them and and that we wouldn't allow for other people to call us a liar or a deceiver and have their witness be true to your God. Help us to, to say things that are right, say things that are true. And even if sometimes that means, Lord, that we might have to, to suffer a little bit or, or pay some kind of a consequence for something that we've done wrong or we've made a mistake, Lord, help us not to, to go to lying as an answer, as a solution to our problems because we know how much, how bad you feel about that and that you have told us over and over again in your word that you hate lying. The Lord, help us not to do those types of things. We love you and we want to serve you to the best of our ability. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's turn to one more song before we...